Were you intimidated to act alongside Olivia? Um, I wouldn't say intimidated. Um, I don't oh, feel. Go well. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I was intimidated. <laughs> No, for me, it was just, I was just really excited up until this point. I hadn't worked with anyone that, that was like an Oscar winner and, and stuff like that, you know what I mean? So for me, I just wanted to learn. I was just excited to, to learn and be around that energy. Phil. It's just static frames with darkness in between. Why did you feel now was a good time to be sharing this story? Well, it's not really just an ode to movie making. It's movie watching, movie showing, going to the movies. I think we all, when we were in lockdown and in COVID, fearing that this would go forever, that we would never be in this situation again being able to go through a wonderful ritual like Toronto Film Festival and seeing all these movies and just being able to sit with people in the dark and be taken on an adventure, you know. But it's, it's not just that, it's about how movies and in the case of this movie, how words and poetry can take you out of yourself if you're um, in some way struggling. If you're struggling mentally, if you're struggling, in this case, you know, racially, um, it's a time of great upheaval, and for both the characters, the central characters, one of them is struggling with mental disintegration and the other is struggling to find himself in a world which is full of racial upheaval. And it's about the way that you can escape those things, that art can take you out of that, that art can give you a way through. What was the inspiration behind Olivia's character and why did you think of her for this role? It was very simple. I've always admired her. I didn't know her when, before I made this movie. And during the period of writing it, I was watching The Crown on television and she was just amazing. And everything she was doing was so translucent, so readable, so uh, every thought passing across her face. And I just thought, oh, that's Hillary. That's the character I'm writing now. First of all, getting a Zoom from Sam Mendes was so exciting that I would have said yes to any script that had turned up. The chance to play things I hadn't played before and a bit scared of it, which was quite exciting. And I just sort of knew, just from our Zoom conversation, so that's, he seems completely, he'd be in safe hands, he really knows what he's doing, and it was a part I sort of wanted to play. Yeah, when I read it, I just felt like I hadn't seen a character like this before. Um, you know, someone that's just full of hope, got a lightness, you know, um, especially where I'm from, you know, that you don't really get to see stories like that. And I just wanted to be a part of something great, to be able to work with people like Sam, Roger, Olivia, Tanya, like, you know, um, and all the other amazing people that were involved. It was, it was special for me. I never thought I'd be able to do those things. So yeah, it was just exciting, exciting story and exciting people involved. And for me, those are the perfect elements to being involved in something. What I leaned into was the love story. I felt it was Sam's love story with the cinema and movie making, the experience, uh, the shared experience of being in, in, in this space together with other people and seeing the film, not just in the audience, but also as the filmmakers. Um, I thought it was a love story between the two, um, Michael's character and Olivia's character. I felt it was a love story between the characters of the film and movie making. So, and then of course my relationship with Michael as his mum. It was our kind of love story when you get to the point where you're letting go of your child and they are right at the cusp of leaving the nest, as it were. So I think that's what appealed to me in just leaning into the intimacy of that and trying to find all the intricacies within those energies. There's a little flaw in your optic nerve. So if I run the film at 24 frames per second, it creates an illusion of motion. What were some of the challenges in filming this movie? Oh, it was always the biggest challenge, the weather. <laughs> no, there was a number of challenges, but you know, at first you think something is going to be incredibly difficult, like we did with 1917, but also this in its own way, because you had to find a theatre that had to really work for the script in terms of its magic and everything, and it had to be on a, the seafront, promenade, facing the ocean. So. I mean, it was a lot of prep with uh, Mark Pillsbury and I think we're walking around different towns and searching for the right place to shoot. So, I mean, that was the biggest challenge for, for me. Was there something specific about the theatre you found that you felt really made it work? 
Well, it was interesting because I think the theatre we ended up shooting in, in Margate, was not what Sam had in, in mind originally because it was a theatre in Brighton on the seafront. And we went to Brighton and it was a fantastic situation, but there was no interior because it had been turned into a casino. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> so then we talked about, well, okay, the interior, maybe we build it as a set because you know, we were, we were kind of adamant that we'd have the real world outside the doors of the cinema. So then it was about finding somehow to get these elements together. We've all been on film sets. I don't know why every time you go, what? Yes. <laughs> and then you look around the corner, it's sort of held together with sticky tape. And, yes. But it's incredible what they did. Isn't yeah. It? Yeah. There's a, there's a strange magic about this cinema. You know, it's a big Art Deco palace built on the seafront and really quite a working class town. And it has a quite un-English feeling to it. I didn't want it to feel quaint and tiny. It has scale, you know, and what Roger says is right. I didn't want to build it. It didn't want it to feel like it was green screen. I wanted it to feel like it was a real place, but it still had to have magic about it. And that place gave us all those things. So you don't see the darkness. Is there a movie that you remember watching in theaters uh, where you felt uh, a, a feeling like that for the first time? I think the first movie that really, as a filmmaker, as someone who wanted to make films or might want to make films in the future was a movie called Paris, Texas, a Vim Vendors film. I saw as a student, where it's the first time that I felt there was a contemporary world that felt mythic, that felt vast and unknowable and beautiful and amazingly shot by Robbie Muller and with a great script by Sam Shepard. And, and it still remains the sort of touchstone movie for me. I've just remembered One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. I remember see, seeing that the first time I saw that. That wasn't a moment when I thought that's what I want to do, but it just went, I couldn't stop thinking about it. Still, I still think about it quite regularly. But Breaking the Waves was, I watched when I was a drama student and that's the first time I went, that's the sort of work I want to do. No, Emily Watson just, I'm not sure I could ever watch that film again. It, I, I cried solidly for about two weeks, yeah. For me, a film that kind of had an impact on me was Of Mice and Men, because we were studying it in school. So, you know, we had to look at it very deeply and, you know, kind of breaking down scene by scene. And then you're really, like, you know, going over this, like these scenes, that like, intimately. And you know, like, for me, that was a, a good process. And I realized this is something I'd love to do. You know, I'd want people to study something that I've done. War game, I'm a little older than everybody else. <laughs> so my experience of the Cold War was a little bit more direct. But I want to say actually Peter Watkins other film, Culloden, which is actually about the Battle of Culloden. And if people haven't seen it, they should, because it's an amazing piece of filmmaking mm. and still very contemporary because he reconstructs the battle on the real battlefield um, but he has modern day reporters reporting on it and it's fantastic use of the medium. And I think I was watching that and War Game and thinking this is what film could do. I think transformative for me is a, is a difficult question because I'd really have to sit and kind of go back uh, into my memory and go, what's really changed me? And so I was thinking, what's an easier way to answer? And I was like, what, what's a film that made me cry? And I cried solidly after Monsters, Inc. Yes. I went, I saw it in a cinema in Stratford-upon-Avon <laughs> and I went to the ladies afterwards and I sobbed. Oh, I couldn't pull myself together. I found it such a moving, I don't know, the little girl and the monster. I can't, can't. <laughs> can't. You've already been in the conversation around, around your performance. Is, is awards buzz something that you pay attention to or where do you keep your Oscar? No, it, Where do you keep your Oscar then? She brings it with her in a handbag to work. <laughs> just, and just, you know, before she'll just... If I'm getting taken about, out, Sam, I don't like it, it, put it on the table. Yes, just, just put it out. Yes. Yes. Never stop yeah. talking about it. If anyone tries to sit next to her, you know, at lunch, she'll just put it uh, on the chair. chair. <laughs> <laughs> but does your Oscar that you already have have a home? Um, well, I, I do... <laughs> I actually... He lives in a cupboard because I'm a little bit embarrassed if people come around. I don't, I don't want it to look like, you know... Who do you think she is? I don't know. So it's really just for me every now and then. If no one's looking, I'll go. <laughs> and nothing happens without light. The central scene for me was always the scene where Olivia's character finally cracks. I found that very moving to watch, to put together, and I still, I still find it upsetting to watch even now. Uh, 
So that, that was a, a big thing for me, and it's, it comes at a crucial point in the movie. At the very end of the film, I think that both of them, both Olivia's character and Michael's character, go off into the future changed by each other. I find that um, that's something that I, I'm proud of. Yes, that scene for me is the one I remember the most, because are we allowed to say we did it twice? Yeah. Oh, well, so we did it twice. Yeah. So, um, we sort of did it twice, didn't we? We, yeah. did it, we, we added to it. Yeah, but I... I'll never know if I think we've talked about it, but I can't remember. But so the second time we did it, it sort of was a bit of a surprise. And I'm so grateful that we got to do it again because I think I did a better job of it second time around. I think because I was thinking, oh my God, I must have done it badly. <laughs> and so the added adrenaline and the added nerves, and it, I was, I felt much better about the second one. I hope we deleted the first one. It's all gone. Okay, great. <laughs> Me and no, I just love watching actors. That's why I like operating the camera. That's why, I, <laughs> that's why I've been doing it for so many years. But you can feel that as well, I have to say, with Roger on the other <laughs> yeah, You can, can feel his support and, and love and respect. He yeah. just kind of radiates <laughs> it, <laughs> which is so lovely, you know. So I always say this, this you know, uh, uh, when Roger's loved something, he, he, a squeeze of your shoulder from oh. Roger Deakins is it's, worth a thousand words. Oh my gosh, <laughs> oh my gosh. I go on and on and they're like, yeah, all right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he squeezes your shoulder, it actually means something. Yeah. <laughs>